So what I'd like to do is we're going to invite Steve Pawlowski and Florian Goodner to join the panel, and we'll have um, you know the remaining time of the session here we can use to um, ask questions because we have a lot of interesting uh, thoughts coming out of this these two presentations. So there'll be somebody walking around with a mic, and if you um, would like to kick off, uh, you can certainly uh, raise your hand if you have a specific question. Um, anybody like to? Yeah, go ahead. Please. Do we have mic over here? My question's for Rocky. I was curious, you, you talked a lot about going after you know, the low-hanging fruit and some of the easy wins and efficiency. Have you since tried to jump the curve and get predictive and preventative with uh, you know, the analytics and the data that you're collecting? Uh, not yet. That's the whole purpose of that iSmart box. We're, we're trying to get better sensor data. Um, those sensors are going to be on the spindles, not just on the machine tool itself. So once we can actually start measuring vibrations and harmonics in that spindle and temperature variations, then that's when we're gonna start looking at predictive maintenance on the machines to where you can say, yes, this machine has been in cycle for uh, 2,000 hours. It's time now for a check or a rebuild or whatnot. Ultimately, what we wanna do is, is have this to where a customer can buy our machine tool. We can have that analytics running, we can predict when there might be a failure and can send a spindle without them even having to lose any downtime, that spindle be there, or whatever part of that machine tool might fail based on some of this stuff. So that's the progression of this smart box, but no, we have not done it with anything currently, but we are planning to do that in the very near future. Thank you. Okay. Follow up on that, um, what are you doing on the quality side? Are you collecting any inspection data or, or um, metrics on the inspection side? As far as all of the parts that are manufactured go through a pretty stringent quality check. Um, the machines periodically have checks that we do. Um, typically every six months we'll pull a machine out, do a, a quality inspection. But yes, we will be able to link that to a, an event. If an event happens, whether it be an overload condition or a crash or something, then that will obviously trigger a response that will be via email through this system triggered to our maintenance department where they will come check the machine out they'll do a full check on that machine so yes we are getting into some of that right now as well perfect image we admit okay uh keith do you envision a scenario whereby um you'll actually use the, the functionality by using it for an incremental revenue stream for your customers, meaning you'll charge them monthly for that monitoring, or I get, I get how you, you utilize it as a competitive advantage to sell more equipment, but realistically, do you ever envision a, an incremental revenue stream by charging monthly your customers? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, we've, we've talked to customers about these are on trial right now, and so we've talked to customers about that, and I, I, I think they are willing to pay for it. Um, I'm just not sure exactly how much. We, do, we uh, the service is pretty affordable that we have to pay GE, and then we kind of on top of that. So, I think where it really starts to become a revenue builder is when I start tying in other pieces of equipment to it, which, which will give our field service some some uh, some revenue to, to install those sensors and and bring them to the data collection box, probably something very similar to what they're doing. And, uh, and then I can charge for a whole rig package. Um, so I also see it as a revenue stream for installing it on our competitor's equipment. Um, unfortunately, there just aren't as many data points to, to monitor. So, so yes, yeah, I, I, I see it that way. I'm just not sure. I'm not sure how long it takes in order to develop the platform where the customer sees it really, really being useful. To, so we may have to gather some data and make some assumptions uh, before we can, we can charge a lot for it. 
Could we maybe we have Rocky to speak to that particular point as well because of the issue of providing services to your customers who maybe have a heterogeneous machinery in their plants so that uh, I mean what's the vision for Mazak going forward to deploy uh, you know more i smart devices into other manufacturing facilities and how do you want envision getting service revenues with regard to that Certainly um, most if not all the equipment we manufacture currently have a sensor package on board already so that's primarily available and with the advent of this new smart box then it makes it very easy to integrate that in if they want to look at just sensors if they want this type of uh, predictive maintenance that is going to be offered then it's a very simple add-on to the existing machines that they're going to be buying as well as any legacy type machines that they have in their facility so there is a, a market there and since this technology is just new to us we've only been it's been installed for three months we're actually We've not brought it to market yet for sale, but that's going to be coming in the next coming months, I'm sure, because there's such a demand for that. Um, price points and all that's being worked out now on what that's going to cost for the switch and how to configure all that to offer that on our price list to customers. So, yes, that will be coming. Okay. So anybody else want to have a speak? To Florian, do you have any comment on that? From the European market, what you see? Um, we see that it's actually this is one of the easy parts to put a price tag on because you, you can calculate the, the amount of money that's saved. Um, uh, an example that came to my mind is, is the wind, uh, wi offshore wind turbines that were set up. Um, we have them in the north and the Baltic Sea. They fail and typically the people that go there for maintenance and they go there because it's broken and they don't really know what equipment is up there. So it's rather frequent. They, they hire the ship, it costs a hundreds of thousands, they drive out. It's a one day effort for, I think, 10, 15 people. One climbs up and in the gondola, he figures out, oh, wrong tools, wrong equipment. Next, next day again, next day is a storm. So this is, this is one of the things where I think it's, it's quite good and easy to, to put a price tag on because you can show direct benefit and direct savings. Okay. I think we had another question over here. Okay. Uh, when you, when you collect this data, um, is, who owns the data in your mind? And if your customers want to claim ownership of that data uh, for the analytics purpose? Typically, Air Factory, we own the data. Um, the agreement with their software provider is that they do the work, get everything up and running, and then the data, that's why we kept it on site. Because of some, some complications and security risks on the cloud, um, we own the data. Now, it's not to say that that may not change in the future. Um, with, with several plants coming on board and starting to use this type of technology, I really feel that that sharing of data is going to be coming in the very near future. So we're calling it air data right now. Um, headquarters may want to see our data at some point. So they may want to be able to remote in and look at that or have us transmit that to them at some point. But for now, we consider it air data. Um, as far as the software providers concerned, they look at our data if we ask them to. They have to get into our system, get on our servers, and help us with problems or whatnot. But uh, that's not for public knowledge. They, they know that, and they're very willing to help when it comes to different problems that we've seen. So really, in the global drilling application, is, do you believe it's your data? Do you, do you consider it your ownership of the data? Yeah, with, um, with our agreement with GE and uh, and the 3G signal that we take off of that one particular rig, it, it's our data. And when our customer starts paying for it, or in, during this trial period, we license it back to them. So they have full use of it. But there, there, there's probably other roads we're gonna have to cross with information leaving the drill site and understanding who owns that and the security of that. And again, I think that's, that's, that's one of the reasons we partnered with a big company like GE, so we could be mindful of that and, and the legal restrictions and understanding where it's used and knowing that it's in a secure place in the cloud um, rather than having some somebody else try to figure out a way to get it off. And just to add to that, that's a, a good point. When these smart boxes start getting out in the field and we're doing analytics on customer spindles, then that question will have to be asked, who owns that data? Do we own it or do the customer own that data? So I'm not real sure how that's going to be solved in the, the coming months when these boxes are starting to go out. Or the spindle provider. 
But uh, Steve, would you like to add something for that? Because you have a, probably a bigger perspective with other customers uh, in addition to global drilling support. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, we've got a fairly large number of customers using this technology, um, using the same technology that we're using with Keith and, and global, global drilling support. Um, and then GE actually uses the same kind, types of technology to monitor it, the fleets of assets that we've sold to customers, whether they be locomotives or gas turbines or jet engines. Um, and so it is a it is a place you know data ownership is a big deal, um, you know in the in the relationship we've built where we're delivering this equipment insight remote monitoring as a service, we've said look we're the service provider we're going to keep the system up and running, you people like Keith have the intellectual property on the assets that they're manufacturing that they're monitoring, um, or even if it's a third party right they they know what the data is and, and it's their analytics and, and it's their data so. Our terms of services clearly say that data is theirs. The only we have we have limited use rights in terms of just understanding sort of uh, at sort of gross levels how much data is flowing, so we can do performance optimization and that kind of thing. Um, when we do service contracts with our customers, it may be a different story. Um, so we have businesses where we're doing uh, monitoring services on all kinds of different rotating assets in the oil and gas and mining space. That's a business called the IDI business. Uh, it's in uh, Lyle, uh, Illinois. Uh, it's part of GE Digital. Um, and, and then there are other asset businesses. So we have a big Armand D Center in Atlanta where we monitor about 2,500 heavy duty gas turbines that are out in the utility space. Um, and in that case, you know, it's really, we've got a long-term service agreement with that customer. We basically say we have to collect that data um, to be able to deliver on the performance guarantees that they need. And so we retain uh, ownership of that data, I believe, that we're collecting for those particular uh, use cases. Because um, really, we're going to get the value. We look at the data in those cases across the fleets of assets and can start to build analytics um, that help us improve the performance and reliability of each of the members of the fleet. All right, thank you. Yeah. Do, do we have another question? Maybe we have another one over here. So I do have a more general question when it comes to the expression IAOT. Mm -hmm. uh, because what I saw from the reports and your presentations, these are more I would say using technologies we have seen a long time in place, like sensors and uh, quality data, uh, process data, and, and share them among a web network and so on. So th we have this with the manufacturing execution system since years. And uh, what, what is not a bad thing, but I want to understand what is coming new from the IIoT, or or do you, yeah, or is this just an, another? let's say, label and other expression of um, technologies and infrastructure we had since quite some years. Well, who would like to field that question? It, it, uh, maybe I'll leave it to... I think the answers are different, right? I think yeah, the I think they're going to be... Um, <laughs> you know, as an in-plant use is, is different. I think the enabling someone like Keith to do data collection from assets uh, around the world really, I think, is in that sort of spirit of how do we how do we take that sort of convergence of telecommunications, uh, technology, network security, cloud computing, uh, and put the data in both their hands and, and their customer hands? I think it's, it's sort of along that way. Um, you know, what, uh, uh, what, what I'd say Rockies on, you know, as they're, they're getting started here, you know, as they start to put these machines out in the field with connected control systems on there, you know, then I think you start to, I think you start to see the, the IoT um, element um, be deployed. But I don't know if you've got other comments. Yeah. Though, Maybe Rocky would like to respond. To yeah, that. just um, from, from a manufacturing perspective, we when we think about machine tools and, and the purpose of machine tools, um, when you talk about um, multitasking machines and, and machines that can do a lot, they have a lot more capability than what they ever have in the past, that's one thing. But when you start talking about the manufacturing of that, and, and how can you make that process better is where I think we're getting into the, the internet of things, industrial internet of things, where we can start looking at that stuff. Yes, that stuff has been around for quite some time, but really starting to use it to make our processes better to, to 
increased capacities and, and increased utilization, things like that. So uh, you have a very complex machine tool that can do several things and then look at how you're manufacturing that. There's room for improvement. That's where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. All right, Florian. Please. Just, just want to add, um, I think the, I know that these things, those analytics were able in the past, um, but they weren't employed to a large extent, um, also because automation was expensive. Um, we have now the uh, ubiquitous computing power. It's nearly everywhere. I mean, your example is good. You use a PLC where your old competitor's product hasn't. So this really adds up, and we are now at a phase, and also when you look back into the usage of uh, industrial PCs in manufacturing, and which uh, the innovation cycle or of end users. Typically, an end user reviews its um, control strategy every seven to, to eight years. And if you look back to the IPC development over the last years, and you begin to realize we are at a point in time where we do have the control power in the field. And yes, we have significantly more sensors also. And this is something that just gains momentum. And from a European perspective, it adds that many now start to add even more flexibility and come down to the batch size one in, in terms of manufacturing. And this is, from my perspective, the movement that's going on. Uh, for the two examples, uh, who did the integration for, for the, the projects? And, and you're both going to offer this to customers, hopefully, you know, sometime soon. But did you look at, at re-examining the, the control system? We, um, uh, I guess you're asking who did the work, how, 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 how the installation went. System integrator or? Yeah, we, we um, GE came to site and put their unit online, but we had to do quite a bit of collaboration between the two of us in order to get, uh, get it configured, get the first one configured correctly to where um, our lube oil sensor, red lube oil sensor inside of their system. So there wasn't a third party. We, we, did, it, we did it together. It probably took, I don't know, 40 man hours or something like that maybe. It's really all about understanding what, um, you know, what data is available in the control system and putting it in context. I mean, uh, your, your product is relatively new in the market. You said you've, had, you've got about 50 of them out in, out in the field. So. You know, it wasn't time for a look at a, a refresh of his control system. They'd effectively just designed it within the past couple of years. So our, our focus is, is being able to help a customer with any, any type of control system, whether it's a custom controller of some sort. If it's got a, if it's got a communications mechanism, you know, we're going to try to help a customer collect the data uh, and, and, and put that data into context that's appropriate for their piece of equipment and, and make that data visible. So, you know, we've got, uh, we've got deployment people that partner with our OEM customers. That's really our target is OEMs so that, you know, we've got that data mapping for his top drives now. It's simple for his people to install the field agent on units on the next, you know, 100 units because that model's been built. I expect what we'll do going forward now that the model's built is we'll install the units whether the customers are intending to use them or not. So, so they're, they're in the cabinets and when it's time to turn them on, we turn them on and, and charge the service. That's, that's, that's the way I envision it going forward. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so I mean, I think it's a good question about the, um, you know, both these questions about what's, what's new, right? So, I mean, if you've got a PLC and you're doing remote telemetry, you got a ton of custom systems integration work in order to be able to pull together systems of systems to get kind of intelligent rig, right? And, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how do we really move forward faster to be able to get these things to be either self-discovering or, you know, because the economics of doing that engineering work mm you know, seems to me to just scale linearly with the amount of data you want to collect from a rig. You know, so I'll, t I'll take a crack at that. I think, 
you know, GE is a big uh, believer and supporter of, of OPCUA. And so, you know, you start to, when you start to have standardized protocols that where the control systems can start to publish um, models of data that are available, I mean, that, that, that for us is really one of those, um, those technologies that dramatically change the cost of deployment um, in, in these kinds of systems. Uh, but you're right, I mean, today, if, if Keith's team has to go in, figure out, you know, the five sensors they want to collect off the mud pump or what sensors are available in the CAD engines or the, the, the draw works, um, you know, there, there's a fair amount of upfront engineering work. The good thing is, by and large, those types of equipment are used over and over. And so what we end up doing in our environment is we'll, we allow Keith's team to build templates for subsets of the assets. So they could do a, a draw works template that may only have five KPIs in, in it and so every time they they can just they can configure their top drive they can say oh well, the customers asking us to collect data from mud pump or from a cat engine of this style so that they can build templates so that once that engineering work's been done once um, you know they can they can re they can take advantage of it and and, and deploy it uh, out into the future but it is a challenge with you know cat you know it's some variation of modbus you know, you may have to put direct sensors on, and and and, and we talk either you know hook the sensors into into either Bluetooth or uh, or into a local remote I/O drop and bring that data back and talk to them as Modbus addresses. There's not a lot of there's you know there's not a lot of good um, the, the lack of standardization in in the sort of industrial space from a protocol perspective does make that a challenge. But isn't it really just an ROI evaluation in terms of the engineering cost going in and then how, how fast they get a payback? Yeah, and, yeah and it is, and, and especially if someone like Keith that, that hopes to make a, a long-term business mm -hmm. out of doing this for across many rigs, mm -hmm. you know, he can say, all right, what's, what's <coughs> am, I gonna, am, I, am I gonna make money on the first one? Maybe you're not, right? But maybe you'll make money starting on unit two or maybe unit three. Yeah, there's there's so many different types of uh, of equipment, AC, DC drives. I, the way I've looked at that in the past is we'd quote the the setup or and the and the making that piece of equipment smart uh, on a time and material basis with our customers, and whether that's cost prohibitive for them, I don't know. A lot of that equipment will never go back to work again. So we may be looking at different types of equipment, AC driven draw works that a lot of that sensory is now part of it. So we're talking PLC to PLC, so. It just, just depends on the product project, I guess. But yeah, we have to be very careful getting into a, a science project like that with our customers, and we, we would never see the return on it. Rocky, would you like to answer, talk to that point as well? Or are you? Oh, okay. Any other questions? <laughs> no, with with the advent of the MT platform, MT Connect platform, um, once you have an agent that is speaking the MT language, it's very simple for that software to pick it up. So those signals just had to be configured. You just had to identify what signals were coming from that legacy machine per se, what identified it as an idle time or a um, machine in cycle or a overload. You just had to identify those, and once that was identified, very simple. So that was. There's not a lot there as far as when it comes to installation. Um, if it's a, a Mazak machine, it's very straightforward. The software is there, you plug it in, it automatically starts generating the signals. If it's a different type of machine with a different type of controller, once you have the adapter set up, the hardware set up, it's very easy for that MT language to be identified. Excellent. I think we had another question out here. Thank yeah, you. Um, since you were using the Cisco switch to generate a lot of the reports uh, during that development, did they mention anything about their fog uh, uh, computing initiative? Mm. Good question. That is still uh, being developed, actually. This is a work in progress. We've been working with this switch now for about three months, and um, I'm not aware of that, uh, but there may very well be some of our applications engineers that are working with Cisco developing that. Uh, this is just a very simple dashboard to look at results coming off those. So I'm sure that as we're developing this, there's gonna be some more um, um, language to that, I guess. And the fog, I'm not familiar with that, but uh, nonetheless, I'm sure that that's something, if it's a useful aspect of that, then that will be something that's gonna be offered with it. 
I don't know if any anyone on the panel would like to talk to the point of the fog computing or okay. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, here we go. <coughs> Rocky, when you uh, installed this new system, did you get any pushback from your operators about Big Brother watching them and that kind of thing? Certainly, that's why we put the 60-inch monitors up. Uh, no, really, that was a concern, obviously, um, from a, a management standpoint, thinking that Big Brother was watching them. But when you have the 60-inch monitors out there, there's interaction with the operators. It's actually a great tool for them to, to use. And a lot of times, if there was a maintenance issue or if there was some kind of problem that the operators had and the communication between an operator to a lead man, to a supervisor, et cetera, sometimes um, priorities aren't set. And, and this is a way for the operators now to go in and say, hey, I told you so, I told you that machine was set or I was having trouble with this and you can make a simple change. So they're getting that buy-in, I think, by having the visualization and having the, the input of saying what's going on on the machine tools. But that was a concern early on um, with six 60-inch monitors and, and the HMIs throughout the shop. That's a very good point of reference for the operators to use as a tool for them to, to, to be able to uh, convey what's actually going on on the machine tool floor. And we've, we've seen that. Um, the operators, I don't think, want to do a, a bad job. I don't think there's any <coughs> operators that come in want to do a bad job. They just didn't have the tools to do a good job. Great. I quickly want to comment on that as well from the European perspective because we are, the whole continent is slightly more concerned about privacy of data than it is here in the US. This means if you have a lot of data created on the plant floor, you quickly run into problems, legal problems, and you run into discussion with the unions, with strong labor unions. The, I know examples where they collected energy data out of machines, and they can, could afterwards determine if the operator of the machine was going for a smoke break or using the bathroom. That, was, that had big issues, so you need to be really careful how to handle the data, and that probably also traces back to who owns the data afterwards because you don't want someone else to have that visibility into your into your plant, into mm. to your employees on the plant. Oh, interesting perspective. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions or actually I just had one question. I think it had it was to for uh, Keith. And had to, and because I was listening to your presentation, you were talking about uh, warranties and the, and the associated cost of providing a warranty. Do you envision, um, do you ha have you done any analysis in terms of your business, uh, how much it lowers your warranty cost in terms of your business by uh, providing this remote monitoring and, uh, and, and uh, evaluating how the, the customers are using the equipment in the field? I don't know we're far enough far enough along to, to really tell you any dollars and cents, but it but it I can tell you it sure um, it sure brings brings to fruition a warranty claim pretty quickly when you're able to go in and look at that information rather than sending a technician halfway around the world mm -hmm. to meet a, a roughneck on the rig floor who said that all the problems started happen after they drop the machine or whatever the case may be. So with the G sensors or the vibration, you can say, well, what happened on this day? And that's likely the cause of, of, of the problem and you were operating outside the parameters. So much the same as when you bring your cell phone in and, um, and, and, and you, they ask you if it's been near the water and you say no and they flip the back open, they have a little tab in there that's turned color or something. You know, they, they, Very quickly they can say, well, we have a shadow of a doubt that they're not gonna give you a new cell phone. So okay. <laughs> that's the way we've explained it to our customers. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Is there any further questions? Or? Oh, great. Excellent. Could everybody hear that question? If they, could you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. You were uh, right. The predicts, you know, how, how is it priced? You know, is it per install or is it analyzed or it is project based? And how, how does it's, that work? It's, um, 
it's grouped in packages and it's and it's a subscription base. So again, it's it's similar to a, like a cell phone subscription. We have zero to ten or twenty units. It's X amount a month, and you get you know a larger volume. It gets much cheaper, but it, it's pretty affordable. It's a, it's a price that I feel like we can we can pass through to our customer and, and make a little bit of money on. No, uh, I mean our goal here is to bend, is to take this technology that we built and, and used inside the company and make it available to as many customers as possible. And so we've tried to, you know, we've eliminated all of the upfront. You know, I started this business about three years ago, um, and at the time when you walked into an AT&T store, right, you walked out with a free cell phone and and a, and a contract. And we we actually modeled the concept on that where. We knew OEMs are very cost conscious. You know, this was new space for them. Uh, they're not sure necessarily how they're going to make money at this. So we took the risk and basically financed the equipment, the installation, and the and the servers and everything, and 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 allow them to spread the cost over time, which is how we expect them to get benefit. Right? They're going to get benefit over time. So we align the cost <coughs> with the benefit uh, to make the technology uh, as available to as many people as possible. All right, great. Thank you very much. Any other questions from, from the audience? Right, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank our speakers and our panelists very much for this uh, great, great speaking opportunity.